Ladies and gentlemen, our opening keynote speaker is Ron Kaufman. Ron is a founding member of APSS. Now, some of you know Ron as a, a busy keynote speaker and a New York Times bestseller. Some of you know him as a speaker who, with his wife, Jen, has built a global training and consulting business. Some of you know him as an advisor and a mentor in the speaking community. And some of you simply know him as that guy who always wears a white shirt and a red tie. What you may not know about Ron is that he and Jen are passionate scuba divers. I share this with you because uh, there's something unusual about the way Ron goes about diving. You see, Ron goes into the underwater world and he collects trash. Now, he says he wants to leave the worlds he visits better than when he found them. In 2009, Speaker Magazine rated Ron as one of the top 25 who's hot speakers in the world. In 2016, APS honored Ron with the first ever Lifetime Achievement Award. And this year, Global Gurus ranked Ron Kaufman the number one customer service guru in the world. Ron Kaufman loves the speaking profession. He loves our Speakers Association. And if you really want to know the truth, he loves you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome and join me in warmly welcoming our friend, Ron Kaufman. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Are you ready? Are you ready? All right. Number one, you need a partner. You need an individual that you can work with, answer questions with, talk to. Everybody take your hands, rub them together. Rub, 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 rub. Make them warm, make them warm, make them warm. Clap twice. Hands up. When I say go, turn either right or left. Say to the person next to you, please be my partner. Ready, go. I'm going to check. I'm going to say one, two, three. You go like this. Ta-da. Show me your partner. One, two, three, go. All right, that's cool. That's cool. You can have one other partner. Or if you were the person in the middle that was going like that, it's okay, you can have two, group of three. Our topic today is how to grow your speaking career with learning, that's why we're here, leverage, grow, 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 and love. Could you feel it from Jerome? Yeah, come on, give him another clap. Jerome Joseph. And here's lesson number one. I want you to read it out loud with me. Ready, go. Connect the history you love with the story you live, and the future you create. And there he was telling us about his grandmother, right? Now, I didn't know until this morning he was going to talk about his grandmother. It turns out I'm going to talk about my grandmother. That's my grandma. Her name was Grandma B. She was a kindergarten teacher in New York City. She taught kindergarten for 40 years. Every single kid needed to come in in the morning feeling like the most special little person in the world and go home and let the parents think like you have the most special little person in the world. And you know what I learned from my grandma? Connect the history that you love with the story that you live and the future you create. And her version of it was, read it with me, make learning fun. How many of you feel like when you make it fun for your audience, they like it better and you get a better review and you're a better speaker? Just let me hit it. Yeah. So what did I do? I took that out into my life. I went to Brown University, an Ivy League college. I graduated with a degree in history, but that's not what I'm known for there. It's not the history that I was studying. It's the history I helped to make. I was captain of the Brown University Ultimate Frisbee team. Ta-da! And I loved the position of being a speaker. So after I graduated, I said, now how can I continue to go out there in the world and bring all of this learning and making it fun, et cetera, et cetera? And I became a Frisbee festival and tournament organizer for eight years after college. And I took it out to the world. Took Americans to China and to the Soviet Union and created citizen diplomacy tours and festivals all over the place. This is the Capitol Mall in Washington, D.C. with 25,000 people. And they're all throwing the Frisbee up in the air at the same time. Who do you think told them to do it? Ready, set? Yeah, that was my job. So then when it came time to get a little more serious and teach something a little more significant and make a little more money, and I came to Singapore and decided to become a service guy. So what was the first thing I did? Designed the t-shirt, right? The whole brand of up your service that I'm known for started like, how am I going to make the learning enjoyable? How am I going to make it fun? And then we scaled that. And so every single time I teach about service, it's not just about service and creating value and having customers and having a strong culture, but actually making it enjoyable. And then that's what I do in my speeches. So I'm as often off the stage, out there in the audience with everybody, helping to have some... So take a moment right now, just use your hands, let's have some fun. One, two, three, go! Yeah! 
And you know, you can take that everywhere in the world because people are people are people. This is in Saudi Arabia. We're out there for the group photograph, right? They've all got a copy of the book. I'm going, one, two, three. And one guy says, I know, you're the Frisbee guy, right? So he puts the book up in the air. <laughs> can I just check with you? How many of you already have a copy of this book? Let me see your hands. Yeah, probably because I gave it to you at one of the earlier events. How many of you don't have a copy of this book? Raise your hand. Okay, during the coffee break, on the table outside, is a signed copy of this book for every single one of you who doesn't already have a copy. It's yours. That's a gift from my wife, Jen, and me. I don't do those things alone. So what's lesson number one? Let's read it together. Ready? Nice and loud. Go. Connect the history that you love with the story that you live and the future you create. What was my grandmother's version of that? Make learning fun. Now, what happened to the little guy? The little guy grew up. Grandma gave me this one. My dad grew up and became this guy. He's an electro-optical engineer. And what do engineers do? Well, he taught me the next point, which is what? Solve? Yeah, find a problem and solve it. And my dad's role model in that has really carried on through my life because this guy's got a bucket of patents in electro-optics. Like, check out this one. Large format camera light baffle apparatus. What the heck is that? I don't know, but it was a problem that no one else had solved. So what did my dad do? He solved the problem. Even after he retired, he and my mom are out there traveling the world. They go to Machu Picchu. This happened in 2011, Machu Picchu. And they're taking them out on the tour, et cetera, et cetera. And they get to this courtyard. And in the courtyard, you've got these two round things that are raised on the ground, on the, on the floor level. And when you look at them closely, you realize something really unique about this. These were not built up on top of the floor. The entire floor was ground down to leave these two round things sitting there. I'm like, why in the heck would you do that? In 1911, when this place was rediscovered by Hiram Bingham, he wasn't sure what they were. So he looked at them and he said, uh, these were mortars for grinding corn. Right. You're going to grind down the entire granite floor of a plaza to leave two circles so you can grind corn. Right. It turns out that it had rained. And so my dad is there, and he's looking at this, and he thinks to himself, I don't think so. And in his mind, what he sees, optics, electro, is what would happen when the sun hits these reflective surfaces or the moon and then it casts a light up onto the wall. And I wonder if I do the calculations, this is actually a lunar and a solar calendar. And he does all the mathematics and he sends my brother who speaks Spanish back down there with the dates, etc. And all the guides are hovered around and sure as heck, at that certain moment, bing, the light goes up and it goes right through a window in the wall. Solved an amazing problem. From 1911 to 2011, 100 years, nobody knew what those things are for. And now there's a little sign right there that says, water mirrors. And the story that the guides tell is not about grinding corn. They explain, my dad solved a problem. I said, got it, dad. That's part of my history. I love it. Let me take that into the world and who I am, what I live, and the future I'm creating. So then in 1990, Singapore has a problem. Singapore is manufacturing low-cost Motorola, Sony, Seagate, Philips. All leave Singapore. And where does it go? China, right? The, the world's factory. And all of the back office and the call center and the data processing leaves Singapore for another big Indian-speaking country with lower-cost labor. Where did it go? India. And Singapore, the little red dot, had a problem. And they decided the way to solve that problem was to become the best in the world in service. Like, they wanted to become the global capital for service excellence. But they needed help because everybody had been trained to work in factories. So they say, okay, how are we going to handle this? Let's go out into the world and find somebody who can help us to solve a problem. And they found a guy who was comfortable with a microphone and had big white socks. And I came in 1990, and I said, great, what's the situation here? They explained. I said, what do you want to do? They said, service excellence. And the first question I asked them is, what is service? What do you mean by that? If we're going to be excellent in it, we've got to have a good definition. I asked 100 different people, what is service? Turn to your partner real quickly. Just look at him and go, what is service? <laughs> and you know what? If I asked you all to answer that question and write it down, I'd probably get 100 different answers. 
right? Some people are saying, oh, you know, service is giving people what you'd like to get as if they were like you, right? Or the customer is always right, which is wrong, right? Or, or you know, make other people happy, which isn't necessarily the right thing to do in a medical situation, for example. Yeah? So I said, we got a problem here. We've got to solve this problem. What is service? And I did. I looked back in my history. I created something, and I wrote a definition. Read it out loud with me. Ready? Go. Service is taking action to create value for someone else. And the reason this definition solved the problem is it applies in every industry. It applies in every culture, in every language, to every situation from the front line, supervisor, manager, boardroom. Make sense? Does it apply to us too as speakers? Isn't that what we're doing? Taking action to create value for yeah, the clients and the audiences that we serve. But then we had another problem. If that's service, what is service excellence? So I decided to crack that one as well. Read it with me. Ready? Go. Service excellence is taking the next action that will create more value for someone else. Why are you here at this convention? Isn't it to learn, like, what could be my next action that will create more value? And that's why it's all about grow, to so help you become better and stronger. So then we had to solve another problem. Okay, we got definitions. How do we teach people to continuously improve service? Every day, in every way, for everyone, inside the company, outside the company, and I helped solve that problem. We created a whole series of 10 principles on service and workshops that can apply, internal as well as external. But then we had another problem. What about the leadership of the organization? Do they know what to do? And so we worked out seven fundamental rules of behavior for leaders and service organizations. And then we had one more problem. What's in between these two? And we identified 12 areas of activity, fundamental building blocks, to create a service culture inside an organization. It's a lot of work. But that's what you do if you're committed to solve a problem. Now, of course, I also wanted to make learning fun. So not just service. It was called up your service, uplifting service. And I've had the privilege of working in Singapore now for almost 30 years. Some of you know that five years ago, I became a citizen of Singapore. Why? Because I love it. And welcome to the head of North Korea. Please come. And I, my first client was Singapore Airlines, and that was great to contribute to the power that they are in the world. And then Changi Airport, the number one service airport on the entire planet. It's incredible. When Marina Bay Sands opened up and they were in trouble because the service was terrible, they came and knocked on our door and said, could you help us? And we were able to do that. The largest insurance company in Singapore, when they wanted to do a rebranding, they came to us to help us do a service revolution that took three years. When the largest telecommunications company found itself in worst service position, we went to work with them, and they brought all the models and solved the problem and became first, and they still are. Now, all of that solved the problem, not only in Singapore, but in a lot of other places around the world. And it was kind of cool because we got so much data, so much evidence, so much provable, quantifiable results that Harvard Business Review last year published an article about us. And the white paper that was behind the article, look what the title is. Read it with me. Go. Engineering a Service Revolution. Go, Dad. Now, this white paper is 18 pages long. And it's packed. It's got all of the case studies. It's got the data. It shows how the principles apply, the stuff that we made up, just like you make up stuff. What happens when you try to do it inside large organizations and you have a problem? How do you adjust? How do you find course correct? There's a copy outside during the coffee break on the table for everybody in the room so you can take a copy of this as an example. Why? Because I want you to be able to do something like that too if that's what you choose to do. Talk to your partner. Say, yeah, I think I'm interested in that. Go. So what's lesson number one? Lesson number one, ready? Connect the history you love with the story you live and the future that you create. Grandma taught me to make learning fun. Dad taught me to solve a problem. Let me tell you about my mom. My mom's the one who said, Ron, you know, life is about, why don't you go out there and serve the whole world? She didn't say it that way. She demonstrated it to me with her life. That's my serve the world. That's my mom at seven years old. That's her immigrant card at Ellis Island. Those of you who know Ellis Island in New York, it's where every immigrant would enter the United States during that time. And the year was 1938. Well, 1938, if you're coming out of Germany, Hitler's coming to power. 
And it's not a good time to be a Jewish person over there. And at seven years old, she got out, didn't speak English, but came to the United States. Most of the rest of the family, except for the directs, didn't make it. That's called Auschwitz. And if you haven't been there to see a gas chamber, you need to go. So you get a sense of how stupidly bizarre humans can be unless we bring the best of ourselves out and help each other bring the best of themselves out. Get it? Connect the history that you love with the story that you live and the future that you create. And that's mom. And she didn't hang on to that like, oh, what happened to the family members and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, there was a wound, but how many of that does that happen to you too? You get hurt in life? You get wounded? You get cut? You like it? No. What happens? You bleed. Where's Rusty? Yeah, we solved that last night, right? You, and be here at 3.30 to hear his version of this. Every single one of us as human beings is going to get hurt. That's part of being a human being, right? You might, oh, this bad thing happened. Oh, I didn't expect that. Oh, somebody betrayed me. And what do you do? You bleed until it becomes a scab, right? Starts to heal over. And what's a scab like? Oh, don't touch it. Oh, it doesn't look pretty. Oh, I don't like it. But eventually, if you take care of it, a scab will heal and become a scar. And you think about scar tissue. It's tougher, right? It's like a broken bone. When it heals, it's actually stronger. So there may be something in your history. You go, I don't love that. And what I'm saying is, but you can. You can look back and say, not that was a horrible thing that happened to me. You can look back and say, that's part of what happened to me, right? And then take it out and do something with it, like mom did. Serve the world. She taught high school for 20 years. And then she was a travel agent sending people into the world for 20 more years. And so that's what I do. And I do it here in Singapore, serving the world. Went back to where I'm from in the United States, serving the world. Went to Romania, which is where the family early, early comes from on my father's side, serving the world. And going to places in the world that I didn't come from, not like this biology or these genetics. And by the way, how many of you have been to the Middle East? Right, we don't have many Middle Eastern here, people here, but do, do we welcome them next year? Would we like them to come? Yes. Would we like everybody to come? Yes. Yeah, but when you go there, wherever there is, you know, be attentive, be respectful, be respectful, right? Because stuff happens. Like, I got invited to Abu Dhabi to speak to the Crown Prince Court. And at the Crown Prince Court, one of their cultural guidelines is you don't want your head to ever be taller than the Crown Prince. So, and which is kind of easy with me because I'm not that tall. But it also means that when they introduce you, you can't stand up and give your speech. So the entire speech is done sitting down. And if you want to see what happens when you take this energy and you put it in a chair for 45 minutes, you can find it on YouTube. I'm in another part of the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, and I'm giving a talk, and it's going really well, and we come to the end, and this person comes up to me and goes, my friend would like to take a picture with you. I think, well, great, I'm always open to meet somebody and take a picture. Like, send the friend up. And the next thing I know, this person comes up and stands next to me for a selfie. Now, if you want to be culturally awake, then you'll understand that just what you can see in the eyes is all they need to know exactly who that is, what mood they're in, and what they're seeing with their eyes, right? The rest of us need the whole thing in the clothing. Right? Yeah. I showed this picture to my mother. And she said to me, you know, I'm so proud of you because you're out there doing what? Serving the world. And I said, Mom, guess where I learned it from? And by the way, if you're interested, that was Mom and Dad when they met. Right, she was 17, he was 19. This is Mom and Dad in Seattle last week. Right, 88 and 90 years old. Rocking it. Rocking it. So what's lesson number one? Read it with me nice and loud. Go. Connect the history that you love with the story that you live and the future you create. And I've taken some time here and I've shared with you some of my story. But what's important is that you tell your story. And that really is important because you've got things in your own past that are there for a reason. They help make you who and what you are. And so don't hide from it. Don't shy from it. Think about it. Connect with it. Come on, bring it out in whatever way you're going to. For example, we all know and love Frederick Herron, right? Convention chair, let's give him a clap. Frederick! But how many of you know that Frederick is an identical twin? Ah, uh -huh, interesting, huh? Huh? Can you imagine having two of Frederick? That's a little scarier. Huh? But 
it's important because he said to me as we were developing the keynote academy recently, he said, so when you have an identical twin and you look at your identical twin, in part what you're seeing is yourself. And he said, now that I've gotten to this age, it's happening for me when I see anybody, that I see someone else, but in them I also see my self. And so where he's going to go next with his career, don't you think that's a part of the history that he should love, that he should carry on to who he lives and what it is that he creates? Take a look at someone like Joanna Barkley, right? Joanna Barkley, where is she? Right over here. Ah! And she is like the dominant guru on the planet for conscious leadership and conscious culture. But how many of you know that from all the way back in her teenage years, she's an equestrian? She has these incredible stories about connecting with horses. Look closely at that picture and tell me which one's communicating with which one. So when you talk about conscious culture, it's not even just about human beings, is it? It's about life. Bring it on. Where's Angelo? Come on, Angelo. And he's been working like, a, yeah, he's been working like crazy. Uh-uh, for APS. Thank you. And he's out. I mean, he's pretty new to the area here. He's going, I'm going to teach about leadership. I'm going to teach about management. So I take a walk with him, and he tells me that he's a professional pastry chef. How many of you knew that? Right? And baby, you need to bring it on. And share that with us. Why? Because, I mean, it's the sweetness of life. It's the dessert. It's enjoying. One more time. Go. Connect the history that you love with the story that you and the future you create. So what's your story? I don't have a lot of time in my talk up here for you to go tell your whole story, but I want you to quickly tell your partner, like, what's the essence of it? Is it something in your family? Is it something that happened to you? Is it something that you studied? Is it something that occurred? Was it something unexpected? What was it? Ready? Turn to your partner. Between the two of you, the one with the longer hair talks first. You have 30 seconds each. Go. Lesson number one, connect the history that you love with the story you live and the future you create. Lesson number two, lesson number two, wealth, success in the career is value times leverage. It's a formula created by a friend of ours named Roger Hamilton. He invented something called wealth dynamics. It's a profiling instrument. And when I met him, he said, Ron, you walk funny. I said, what do you mean, Roger? And he said, well, your value leg is really long. I was a keynote speaker, and that's all I was. I said, yeah. And he goes, well, your leverage leg is really short. I said, what do you mean by that? And he says, well, all the value is in your speech, but there's nothing for people to have afterwards. And I hadn't even written one book at that point. But it kind of gave me an insight to, oh, there's two parts of this business. One is getting your value really, really high, so you're amazingly good. And then the other is scaling it and taking it out there to the world, multiplying it. You need a leverage model of some sort. Now, you don't have to have that. And at the Keynote Academy this year, how many of you were there? Pretty fun, huh? Yeah, and Frederick and I are like at opposite ends of the spectrum because Frederick is a pure keynote speaker. What does he want? He wants to get the gig to be the keynote speaker. How good a keynote speaker is he? He's the best. He's the best. If I'm ever responsible for doing a convention anywhere, anytime, on any topic, who do I want as my keynote speaker? Frederick Heron, right? But after the 60-minute keynote, he doesn't want the back-end workshop. He doesn't want the seminar. He doesn't want the pre-webinar. He doesn't want to do any program for them. He wants the keynote speech. Value, big, but it's value times leverage equals one. And so then the question is, how many of those ones can he get? And this is a busy guy. He's all over the planet. I don't just want the keynote. I want the three-year organization-wide licensing agreement with automatic renewal for the next decade. Right? We're different. And the beauty of this profession is you can be different in your own way. We call it a speaker's convention because we have something to say and there's kind of a voice that goes with it. We want to bring it out. But you can do that and you can do a whole lot of other things as ways of scaling. And when you're here at this convention, I think that's what you came for, was to learn how do I do these different things better? How do I become more valuable and scale? So I'll tell you just real quickly, let me show you my story. I'm a great keynote speaker. I get up with my magic markers. I got my flip charts, but I'm leveraged times one because all I've got is me as keynote speaker. And then I realize if I'm going to scale this, if I'm going to put a leverage longer leg to create more success, more value, more wealth in the world, then I got to get in front of the camera. 
and create a whole series of instructional videos explaining what I do so that I don't have to be there. And then created a whole series of 10 fundamental principles about how do you deliver excellence and service. And then created worksheets and created workshops. And then created all the material necessary so that somebody else could teach the workshop. So we could have a workshop leader certification program and take that whole thing out into the world and have it be translated into 15 different languages today. That's not the value part, that's the leverage part. You guys with me? Now, if you choose to build a really big leverage mechanism, you may also need to build a team. And so Jen and I now, who built this company, we got 16 full-time employees, we got people around the world, we got different licensees, and it's a pretty amazing experience. And we have some advice for you. If you want to scale and grow your business and grow a whole team, and you feel like called to it, make it happen, do it, then do it. But if you want to maintain your life in a way that you can go scuba diving, or that you can have a life and do other interesting things and have a certain kind of freedom, then think very carefully and maybe don't do it. Now, here's the question for you. If wealth is value times leverage, which of these two right now will make you a better and more successful keynote speaker? What are you here for? Do you want to increase your value? Do you want to get your content depth? Do you want to get your presentation skills? Do you want to learn how you do your material when you're up on stage? You're in the right place. We've got a lot of good content on that. You can figure it out. But you may say, no, 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 I'm here to scale. I want to magnify. i got to figure out how to leverage. Like James Taylor yesterday, he did a beautiful job for us on being a summit organizer. I never even thought about that before. It's another leverage mechanism. Give him a clap. Which of these two will make you better? It could be both. But if it's both, then is it like 80-20, 60-40? And then, given what it is you want to learn about, what are the skills you need to learn in that area? Turn to your partner. You've got a minute with each other. The short or no-haired person talks first. Ready? Value or leverage, and what are the skills you need to learn? Go. So let's go to the next lesson. The next lesson is actually around learning to learn. Because if you're going to learn certain skills, now it's like, give me those. Like, how do we actually learn? You know, what are the, what's the components of that? How do you become a better, more skillful learner? It's a skill that will help you learn the other skills. So, for example, in my case, when I went from keynote speaker to let's build a whole business, there were a lot of things that Jen and I had to learn that we didn't need to know when we were doing pure keynote speaking. For example, check the list. You've got everything in there from trademarks and licensing and marketing and sales for large organizations and delivery services, logistics, opera. I could go on, oh my God. And let me give you an example. Let me just take one of those. Licensing. So if you're doing licensing, that's different than selling. So then you got all kinds of constraints and da da da. And what do you got to learn? All this stuff is part of licensing. You're like, oh my God. Right? Let me just take one of those. Look at this thing down here called Master Service Agreement. Do you know when Frederick books a keynote? Do you know, like, you know, I said, show me your, can I see your agreement? Because we're preparing the keynote academy. He goes, I, I don't do agreements. I said, what do you mean don't do agreements? He goes, I just send an email. And I go, well, then, you know, like, what happens if they change the date or they cancel the last minute? He goes, that's okay. And I go, well, you know, how do you, and he goes, well, when it's over, I send him an invoice. How do you do that? I send him an email. That's it. When we do licensing with a, with a client organization, the master service agreement is 27 pages. Okay, there was a ton of stuff that we needed to learn. And we had to learn how to learn all that stuff. Now, here's the good news. The good news is, especially with the support of people in APSS and in, the career, in this industry all over the world, you can learn every single one of these things. Here's the bad news. You have to learn every single one of these things. And you may say, that's not bad news. I'm pumped for this. You know, I was at the convention. I want to leverage. I want to scale. I want to multiply. I want to grow. Bring it on. Let me hear that. Ready? Go. Bring it on. And you've got a mood that lets you, like, just tackle it and make it happen. But let's be honest. We're human beings. And sometimes you don't feel like, bring it on. You feel more like, make it go away. <laughs> Come on, say that with me and put the right emotion. Ready? One, two, three. Make it go away. So then it's not just about learning to learn. It's also about learning to navigate the moods that are involved and associated with declaring yourself to be a beginner in something, 
especially when you're already so good at so many other things. It's a mood about making mistakes and learning from mistakes. And so you've got to actually think about and get yourself involved in which moods do you want or need to cultivate in your life because they make you better, they make you stronger, they make you more resilient, they make you able to do this. And which moods will arise, because we're human, that you want to moderate, you want to minimize, you want to maybe even eliminate in certain situations. And then, because we are public characters, it's not just cultivating mood, it's actually learning how to orchestrate moods. Like the music in the room and the setting and the layout and the way you interact with people. Got it? Now, this topic was actually written about by a very good friend of mine named Gloria Flores. It's a book called Learning to Learn and the Navigation of Moods. How many of you have a copy? Nobody yet, because I hadn't told you how important it was. But during the coffee break, on the table outside, you're going to find a copy of this book for each and every one of you. Lesson number one was connect the history that you love with the story that you live and the future you create. Lesson number two is that wealth is value times leverage. And lesson number three is learning to learn and the navigation of moods. Turn to your partner. Answer these questions. Which moods do you need to cultivate, develop, make stronger in your being? Which moods arise that you go, that's not helpful and productive for me, and I'm going to take on the challenge of learning how to manage that and bring on some other stronger, better mood, and then what moods do you want to orchestrate in your life with your family, with your friends, with your clients in the world? Lesson number four, invest in your dreams. I don't know if you've seen these before, but that's actually a Singapore $10,000 bill. It's the highest single piece of currency that exists anywhere on the planet. It's real, it's genuine, it's 10,000 Singapore dollars. Oh my gosh. And I just use it as like an iconic representation for the fact that you do have to put some time, energy, resources, and sometimes some money into your dream to make it come real. I, I give you a personal example. This is a video production studio. Notice the lights and the ceiling. You got the green screen and the other screens that can drop down from the back. It's in our house. Actually, that's not the studio. That's an artist's rendering of the studio. That's the real studio. Right? Yeah, it costs more than 10000 But it was a dream. You get that? It was like a picture in our mind. What could we do? What would we like that? And then we invested in it to make it real. And what does it enable today? I can serve clients all over the world. I can do things for, you know, different people at different times. We've got fiber going in from two different companies. Who knows what we'll do with that digitally in the future. But to even make it possible, I had to invest in our dreams. So then I think about, okay, what am I going to do next? What's the dream? And you guys know me, and you know what I'm known for professionally, which is what? Service. I'm like the service guy in the world. And what am I known for service to? Customers and colleagues and building corporate cultures and sometimes in government, a little bit nonprofit, but basically I'm like the commercial transaction service guy so far. But when I look at the future that I want to create or that Jen and I together want to create, we'll keep the service part. But we don't just want to do it about, you know, what's going on in terms of money and transactional exchange. So we're going to change it from service to customers and colleagues. Let's make it service to all of humanity. Let's make it service to life. And as I was reflecting recently in preparation for this and thinking about, you know, so what's been going on in my life and what do we want to do with the many years, hopefully, that are left? And I started thinking about, like, what is the, really the essence of service? It's not about the commercial transaction. The essence of service is care. You serve someone because there's something in you that cares about doing something for somebody else or doing something for your family or doing something in your community. Read it with me. Ready? The essence of service is Care. What is the essence of care? Exactly. The essence of care is love. And I really, you know what? That's really what I want to teach about. But I'm not old enough to do that yet. I mean, I, I really can't at this age, at this point, go from customer service to the love bunny. People are going to go, you know, what do you do? Take drugs? I mean, you know, what happened to him, right? And I'm going to be respectful to the identity of world customer service guru and leverage the heck out of that for continuing to serve humanity because that's the future I create. 
So then, you know, what's the transition between commercial service and being 80 years old when I can have the long beard and shave my head and only teach about love? And I'll see you here then 20 years from now for the convention. But in the meantime, let's tackle care. What is care? What does that mean? And it's like service. i got to solve that problem. Because if you ask 100 people today what is care, you're going to hear 100 different answers. That's a problem. Now, it's not a problem in some other areas of life. For example, if you're studying the organics of life, it's called what? Biology. If you're looking at sort of, you know, an ecosystem, an environment, it's called what? Ecology. If you want to get into rocks and mountains and stuff, it's called what? Geology. If you're into the digital infrastructure and you've got the gadgets, it's called what? Technology. If you're into studying beards, it's called pogonology. If you want to study the art of human kissing, it's called philomatology. If you're into therapeutic mud, it's called pileology. There's 1,528 words in the English language that end with ology. And there isn't one for care. Huh? What should it be called? Careology. The word doesn't exist yet. But it will. And you see that little circle R at the end? You know what that stands for? Responsibility. Because my wife and I are going to bring it on. We're going to figure this thing out. We're going to solve the problem. We're going to take it out to the world. Oh, and by the way, and by the way, you might go like, careology, that's a stupid name. My mother hates the name. But you know what? A lot of you thought that was a pretty stupid name too. Up your what? And yet in our lives all over the world, that thing follows us from morning until night. So what was lesson number four? Read it with me. Go. Invest in your dreams. Lesson number three. Learning to learn and the navigation of moods. Lesson number two, wealth equals value times leverage. Take a deep breath. And lesson number one is what? Connect the history that you love with the story that you live and the future that you create. And that's why all of us are here, so that we can grow and give and be all of who we are. And when I say we, I mean all of us, not even those just alive now, but generations to come and to come and to come. So welcome to your APS 2018 Speakers Convention, and may you learn a lot about how to love, learn, and grow. Give your partner a hug. I got one more thing I need to do. Jen, would you come on up here on stage, please? You know, I had to talk to Jen about what happens during the coffee break so you guys can get the free books and you can get the free white papers and you can get the other free book. But I don't know how many of you have ever seen a $10,000 Singapore bill. I want you to know that during the coffee break, on the table, for, you're going to find coffee. <laughs> but this $10,000 will be our first contribution when APS sets up a charitable foundation, which will be coming in the years to come. For right now, I'll put it in your good care. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the privilege of being here. We love you. Mwah!